This is an otoplasty tutorial. It replaces the one that I shot a few years ago. I've really matured my thinking since I've done a ton of otoplasties and I really want to emphasize to you some new thinking. The best way to think of an otoplasty is to divide the ear into three parts, the top, the middle, and the bottom. And when you start to think about the protrusion of the ear in terms of those three components, you can almost do some self-diagnosis before coming to see me and figure out where the problem is. The top portion is usually that hangs out is called a lop deformity. The lop deformity means that the antihelical fold, which is the fold right here between the helix and the concha is absent. So this ear flops forward or lops forward. And so when the outer ear, this upper portion falls forward like this, that's a lop deformity. The way to correct a lop deformity, if it's in isolation, for example, is to put in what's called mustardase sutures. The mustardase sutures are help to retro displace the ear back and bring it back into better alignment with the total ear complex. The main thing with this is I don't cut through the cartilage here all the way because you can show the edges of, of the cartilage. I've seen a ton of patients that have come through my office that have had this upper portion cut through and you can see those edges show up on the front. Fortunately, I don't do that. I do score the back side of the ear and, excuse me, score the back side of the cartilage and really soften that so the ear is pliable and re it returns back to where it should be. Sometimes with a lop deformity, there's a little bit of relaxation for the ear, but never back to where it started. It may relax about 20% back, but I don't overcorrect for that. There's a question on YouTube about that. I just bring it to the point where it looks good and it may just relax a little bit, but always looking natural and looking good. So the lop ear deformity is not about cutting away, it's about suture positioning the ear to make it look better. But is that the real answer for all ears? Actually, there's a component of the middle ear called a cup deformity. This central area, the conchal bowl or conchal bowl, is an area that can be excessive. And you, if you look at it, the center part that sticks out, so for example, if you take the lop portion of your ear or the upper portion of your ear and pull this back and this protrudes out, then the problem is a combination of a cup and a lop. Rarely do I do an isolated cup. I usually almost do some component of a lop deformity, but then about 30% to 40% of my cases, I combine it with a cup. And so what that is, is actually conchal bowl excision. So I do resect a little bit of the cartilage here, but it doesn't show up like up here because it's buried inside the curvature. You don't see it. So why take out cartilage? Why can't I just tack the cartilage back to the, to the skin back here? It doesn't last. Um, it, it's a very unreliable way to create uh, a positioning of the central pole. So the central pole has to be brought back with a slight degree of cartilage excision uh, called a conchal resection. And that's what really helps position the ear into a better alignment. And the bottom portion is a lobule. This is the area where you put, or also known as the ear lobe. The ear lobe is also very important because sometimes, and you can do this at home, if you press the top portions back, this flips out. And that looks very unnatural. So the lobule is, to me, not quite as important as the upper two areas, but almost as important and should be considered. So if I see that during a procedure that the lobule is either by itself already too far out, or the fact that when I push on the upper portions, this part comes out, then I set the conchal area, uh, excuse me, I set the lobule area back. I've tried a lot of different techniques to manage this, and I've found the best way. In the past, I used what's called V2Y pullbacks that I try to pull the skin back, but the, the lobule would unreliably pull back a certain distance. I also tried uh, cauda helicus excisions, which is taking the tail of the, the cartilage out and just removing it, and then letting the ear naturally set back. Sometimes the ear would still not set back all the way. Now what I found to be the best technique in this area is a um, actually taking the cauda helicus, which is the little remnant of cartilage at the bottom, and securing it to the conchal bowl. So I actually can almost precisely position the lobule as I would like it to be after I've set the upper and middle poles so they should s stay in alignment. So the ear itself, the, the desire oftentimes people have is the ear has got to be way back here, and that's a big mistake. I was looking recently at some of uh, my colleagues before and afters, uh, obviously I won't mention where it is, but the, I was looking at the upper ear poles, and they're like way back here, and this lobule's over here. It shows a misunderstanding of total ear balance. So when you think about a protruding ear, you want the total ear to be in balance. So, and every action has a reaction. Sometimes when I pull the, the, uh, the, the antihelical fold back, this part protrudes more, I've got to manage that part. And sometimes when I pull this part, the lobule pull, pulls out more. Everything has got to be in alignment. And a good way to understand how I try to look at where my results are now is what's called helical show, which means that if I over pull back this top portion, this area, center area may not only 
stick out more, but the helix may be hidden back here. This rim may be off. So what I'm trying to do is create overall balance at all three levels when I'm trying to reduce and bring better uh, results to a protruding ear or what's called a cosmetic reductive otoplasty in medical parlance. So that's a basic idea of understanding um, protruding ear otoplasty in terms of technique for reduction. There are other, other components to uh, ears that I want to talk about, some things that I do also do and some things that I also don't do. So let's first talk about what I don't do. If you're a, if you're a little child that has a microtia issue, in other words, you have an absent ear or a very, very deformed ear where it's not present, uh, and, you, and that is something I don't do. I just want to make sure so I don't get phone calls about that. There are very good specialists that do that. There are several reasons I don't do that. Number one, it's not something I specialize in. Number two, it takes a lot of different procedures, like four or five stages with rib grafts. I've done that when I was doing my training, but I've not done that in clinical practice. It's something I'm not very interested in pursuing. It also requires a huge team approach. You've got to have audiologists to make sure the, ear, the child can hear, otologists to make sure they can reconstruct the hearing mechanism. Um, um, and psycho psychological, pediatric support, uh, hospitalized care. So microtia where the ear is gone completely or not present is something I don't do and that's not what this video is about. Are there other types of ears that I fix? Well, yes, actually what's interesting is there's a lot of small ear uh, treatments that I fix. Um, for example, there can be a, a folding ear where the ear looks folded over. I can usually either position the ear back or I can trim the excess helical show and, and bring that into alignment. The gentleman I just did yesterday, I did a cup and lop ear combination procedure, but he had this little weird bend on his upper helix. I went and shaved that down and smoothed out the rim. Um, sometimes there are what's called unilateral otoplasties with one ear being more protruded and I fix just one ear. Some I've done where one side's a cup lop and one side's a standard uh, lop deformity. I've done it that way. So there's a lot of combination procedures and all these little subtleties in terms of understanding the otoplasty may not be very uh, clear in your head and don't overthink this. Sometimes you may think you have a cup and a, not a lop or a lop, not a cup. You come into me and I look at it, I'll tell you what you have in less than one minute and it will give you a better idea. So once I've done a personal stra uh, strategy for you, I think it becomes clear. The reason I think I'm, I'm skilled to do not just a reductive otoplasty, which I've done a ton of, um, but I've also, and I think I do more otoplasties than most people. I do one of these about every other week. But also the reason I think I can do these sort of unusual ears that have little weird deformities that this is hanging off or this is a little bit protruding there and have literally done a lot of these cases and felt very comfortable with it is because what I do is I take the education I have from reconstructing ears for cancer, which I've done a ton of in my training as well as early in my practice. I don't take insurance anymore, so I do very few of those now. But from that education, I'm able to extrapolate and, and, and bring to the table of understanding how to do um, a reduction of the ear without causing problems. An example is I was speaking to a dermatologic colleague of mine who's a Mohs surgeon, a type surgeon does reconstruction of the ears, and she says, how come when I you know, took out part of the ear, it did this, it stuck out? I said, what did you do? I took a wedge and closed it. I said, you can't do that. An ear, you can't just take a wedge and close it because it will change the protrusion of the ear. Um, and so what I try to do with that is I do sliding uh, maneuvers where I'm taking, borrowing skin and from lobular skin and sliding things up so that I can reduce the overall ear contour or shape it differently if there's a deformity without making it cup out or actually ma making it more protrusive. Um, that's maybe a subtle point. It's for those people out there that have more sort of quote unquote unusual ears that are not a traditional uh, cup or lop deformity and I can actually oftentimes at least improve that. Maybe not completely fix it but improve that. So hopefully this uh, updated version of uh, otoplasty tutorial is helpful for you. If you really want to understand sort of the nature of the recovery, I've got a lot of videos out there, video diaries. You can see people every day. I've also got an aftercare tutorial for otoplasty so it's a little bit beyond the scope of this uh, video. But I just wanted to go through an updated philosophical approach to how I um, work on protruding ears for cosmetic reductive otoplasty.